Welcome, Fight Fans, to this special edition of Spotlight Interview. Oh, it is going to be fantastic because we have one of the best pound for pound fighters in the world joining us. Teofimo Lopez is here on Pro Box TV, your boxing channel. George DiMatellis alongside Pauli Malinaji and George Jakovic. And George, it is an honor to have one of the best fighters on the planet to talk about his career, his life, and his upcoming fight against Jermaine Ortiz. Man, who better to talk to yeah. than the champ right here, Tio Primo Lopez. Tio, you got a big fight coming up February 8th. But before we talk about that with Jermaine Ortiz, we interviewed you a couple of months ago. And the very first question we asked was, hey, are you still retired? You said you were. And then no one believed you. We talked about fights coming up. So I have to ask again. I know you have a fight coming up. You're not retired, are you? Oh, um, well, first and foremost, I want to thank you guys and everyone at Pro Box TV. Uh, really, really grateful to be back here and uh, really talk more and more stuff about boxing and, and the sport that we love the most, you know. So, you know, going to it, uh, yeah, I'm not retired, man. I, I think I just did that just for the downtime. I needed some time off just to spend time, quality time with my son. Yes, sir. Got you. So, well, George, I'll, I'll just lead in. February 8th, Jermaine Ortiz. You you got a fight coming up. Um, tell us about Ortiz. I know you have a history with him. Can you get into that a little bit? Yeah, actually, uh, Jermaine Ortiz, uh, the the technician, they say, you know, and this guy, you know, he faced Vasily Lomachenko, a, fr a former opponent that I faced and a champion, you know. So Jermaine Ortiz, we go back like nine years. Uh, we faced each other in the 2015 National Golden Glove finale. And, um, you know, it was a great, great scrap up. You know, um, everyone knows the National Golden Gloves is a very, very tough, tough competition to win, uh, let alone even get there and compete. So, you know, I know I'm facing somebody that's definitely got the skill sets to uh, give me a run for my money. Yeah, Teo, so this is actually you know, why we love having the, these inside kind of interviews like this. You mentioned the, the history with you and Jermaine Ortiz at the National Golden Gloves. Now, for anybody that's been a, a part of the amateurs, you know, those, now, those national level rivalries, we're, we're, we're a big deal, I and mean, you used to get everybody's juices full and everybody get really uh, pumped up. So when you see a... Now it makes it even cooler for me. You, may, you see a rematch of the National Golden Gloves. I mean, mm -hmm. the National Golden Gloves tournament was one of the bigger ones yeah. nationally. Uh, you know that uh, anybody who's done uh, amateur boxing knows that. So, so the, 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 the fact that this is a rematch of the National Golden Glove finals obviously uh, shows what the level of, you know, the, how high of a level you guys both are and how, how far you guys have come going forward because again despite the fact that the nationals are so difficult to win and despite the fact that the nationals are are uh, cool to you know have those national rivalries in the finals a lot of guys that win national titles or get to these national finals you know from my experience didn't pan out so the fact that you are now facing each other in a big main event after a national golden goes final against each other nine years ago that's uh that's something interesting man uh, that that it is, Paulie. I mean, I mean, it's great that you understand it. Obviously, you know, climbing up the ranks from the amateurs into the professional league, um, it's not easy, not easy at all, you know. But hey, but that's my kind of resume that I have thus far in the professional, um, in the professional boxing game. Yeah, it's all and, about fighting and beating the best. And that's the thing, Teo. I want to ask you, how did this guy go between the between the radar, like below the radar? You got you have you went to the Olympics, obviously. So you got uh, you wanted this guy, you know. I, I mean, when we've seen him against Lomachenko, he impressed, right? And, but he's yep. kind of been below the radar. So it's one of these guys that I always, when I talk about you, I always think to myself, you're kind of like Tyson Fury in that if there's a danger zone, your, your radar is real high. If, they, if there's sometimes people are not looking at you like you're going to be tested in an, in an opponent, you don't look as good because you, you, I think mentally maybe you kind of sleep. And Fury does the same thing, and I feel like you do the same thing. And so I look at Ortiz as a guy who's dangerous, so I feel like, okay, this guy's always got to fight tough opponents he, because you have, a, for me, the toughest resume. You know what I mean? The, the most difficult resume out of all the top guys in and around your weight class. You got to, for me, you've had the top resume. And it's like, Thank I you. feel like that, I feel like almost like it's a necessity for you, right? Because we see like, whenever you raise, your, the, you raise the level of opposition, your level raises. And people always question it because you know what? You'll have some subpar performances against guys who you should have looked better against. And people are like, oh, well, can he handle this, this, this monster now? And you handle it, and you handle it impressively in flying colors. You know, we were talking about that when you were first exploding on the scene. Uh, was it too quickly for you to move on uh, against Kamboso? I mean, again, not against Kamboso, against uh, uh, Komi, and then Lomachenko, and then you, you pass with flying colors. And then the Kamboso fight kind of, you dipped a little bit. And then you come back with Josh Taylor, and everybody's shocked. So is, it, is this a reason why you're picking a guy like Jermaine Ortiz and not maybe a faded ex-champion who you could you know, just use as a resume filler? 
<laughs> um, no, to be honest, I was trying to get the rematch clause with, um, well, I was trying to get the rematch with George Cambosis Jr. And then that didn't happen. That fell off. We tried uh, all these other fighters, Devin Haney, um, spoke to, like I said, and with Joe Fisher and on LinkedIn. That didn't happen, you know, and we had the Madison Square Garden sphere. You know, that's that's the beauty about it. This year, um, whether it's this year or next year, it definitely has to be a great dance partner. Um, but they, they definitely want me to open up the Madison Square Garden sphere for boxing. So that's pretty awesome. You know, not Canelo, not these other big names that they talk about or the face of boxing. So it goes to show, like, my uh, where I stand in the sport. Now, when it came to it, though, Jermaine Ortiz, I know uh, Bruce Trampler and Brad Gumman, who are, like, the Hall of Famers and the best matchmakers in the game, they really uh, was throwing that out there and was giving me these names, Jose Ramirez, um, Jermaine Ortiz, and uh, I think who was the other one? Uh, it wasn't really something that sparked my interest. You know, so um, with the Santa Martin fight, the Cambosis fight, those two things were, I would say, needed in my, in my, um, in my stance of understanding mental strength, you know. That was really it, you know, uh, Cambosis. I don't overlook any of my opponents because I've been there where I've looked overlooked them in amateurs. I remember going 12-0 and 0 in the amateurs and think that I'm going to get this one like a sweet cake, and nope, you know, you lose. And see everybody turn their back and walk away. So going back and forth with all these things, I honestly got to a point where, you know, I needed this to make me better mentally, uh, much more um, physically as well. And, um, you know, when it came to Ortiz, I didn't want that fight. I was trying every other fight from the Haney's, Cambosis, um, Ramirez. We even went down to Jose Ramirez, and he said he wasn't ready for February 8th. A lot of these guys, a lot of these fighters, they blow up and wait. You know, after I beat Josh Taylor, um, I took six weeks out. And what did I do right after? I always stay on the low, man. I keep everything on the DL. And, and what did I do? I actually started training. Just started training, training, training. So I've been training since August all the way to January now. So I've been ready. It's all about making these fights happen. And it was very hard to make these fights happen. Nobody wants to face me. Uh, I guess after the performance that I did with Josh Taylor. So now it's all about executing with this fight. You know, everyone thinks I'm going to overlook this guy, Jermaine Ortiz, or I already am. And that's beautiful. You know, uh, you never know what you're going to get from me. And that's the, that's the, that's the, like, how can I say that eye candy, sweet, money-making machine that you need in the sport? So, because everybody's going to watch on February 8th. Yeah, it's going to be a great fight. Teofimo Lopez joining us here on Spotlight Interview on Pro Box TV. All right, Teofimo, this is the second time you talk to us here on Pro Box. So, I want to ask you, what are your impressions of Pro Box TV and what we've been doing when it comes to boxing? Well, you know, um, I'm actually, you know, coming back into this, you know, and seeing everyone on display from Pro Box TV. Um, I think it's just it's really remarkable to see where we could take this if we know how to maneuver it correctly. You know, the fight, the fights that need to be made are the best fighting the best. You know, I see all these other promoters. They, they kind of like they put so much investments on these top fighters that people want to see fight against each other. However, it's it's like they haven't got their money back yet. You know, and, and it's, it's sad because they say this is the business of boxing. And I know Paulie knows this best. And it's kind of it's frustrating now because we're coming at a day of time where MMA is starting to get more recognition than boxers because of the fact that they're just putting fights on whether they win or lose. They just like seeing these guys face each other. And I came back for to make boxing great again. Really? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and how do I do that? You know, I got a lot of a lot of young fighters coming onto my stable now. You know, takeover promotions, I may I may change it to takeover sports because I may cross over where I get MMA fighters along the way and maybe star talent. That's whether music or anything, because uh, it's all that's what it's all about. You know, it's about making the sports great and, and making boxing what it needs to be today. And that's the best fighting the best. When I see Pro Box TV, I love the way you guys have the platform. You know, and I, I spoke to Bruno Santos and everything. And I told him, hey, listen, man, after this fight, you know, I give you guys some exclusivity. I'll give you guys what you guys need. Um, but I definitely want some of my fighters to be on that on that display. Yeah. You know, and, and it'll be it'll be perfect. You know, I think that just to see a different outlook, you know, I've been around the zone, been around ESPN and uh Triller at one point. I think that, you know, seeing and weighing my options here, you know, um, what better way than to start with someone like Pro Box TV? Yeah, and Taylor, you, know, you, you talk about the best fighting the best. You're in Probably the, the best division in the sport, 140 pounds. I mean, you've got Devin Haney. You, you've got Probably. Tank. 
there. Oh. No, no. Well, that no, no. I didn't say you. You are the best at 140. This is the best division in the sport that you're in. Well, any sport, Maybe. any division, any division Teal Females in is the best. Look at well, 35. You got, you got Devin, you got Tank, you got Matias. You want to throw Garcia in there, Roller Romero? You've got some really great matchups that fans want to see. Do you envision you? I know you want to fight these guys, but are those fights going to happen in 2024? The the thing is, like, see, I'm gonna tell you guys. Look, George, um, to everyone here, it's like that's why I went up to 141st. It's like I already knew they were gonna come up and wait. I could tell. I'm a fighter. Um, you tell, you could tell the, where they're going to go. They're going to have to go to 140 because they blow up in between camps. And I'm like, well, let me go get the big fish first. And that was Josh Taylor, the guy that beat everyone in the division, the uh, guy that was and is undisputed at that time. No one beat Josh Taylor. He just relinquished his belts. So now I'm the kingpin, yeah. linear world champion. And no matter what, whether those guys fight each other back and forth, back and forth, the only guy that's number one is Teal Fimo right here. So it stays that way, you know, and whoever really wants to step to that next plate, then we could talk about it. And until then, you know, they're, they're going to keep moving these guys and do what they have to do. You know, and they're doing more clout than anything. Every fight that I've done, every person I said I called out, I have face. Have I not? Yep. So, you know, my whole thing now is like going for a triple crown. We did two crowns. 135, Loma. Josh Taylor, 140. Now I want 130, 147, Terrence Crawford. And mm. if and if it's not Crawford at 147, then we'll do it at 54. Um, so it's it's okay with me, you know, because the thing is that you got to understand. Look at Floyd Mayweather; um, he will weigh in when he would fight at 154. He will probably weigh in at 151, and yeah. and and these guys will blow up at like maybe 170, 180, and that didn't stop him from beating the brakes off of him. So it's not about the weight bully. I'll be honest. Look, when I faced Josh Taylor, we did 12 rounds, and he fought dirty, and the referee allowed it. He fought dirty in all those rounds, and he was putting all his 168 pounds on my body. Big dude, by the way. Tallest guy I know I will ever face, and biggest, like, dude was a giant at 140. I can see why Josh Taylor beat so many of these guys like Regis Prograce and Jose Ramirez. So, you know, when it came to it, it's not about the weight bully. That's, that's, a, that's a myth. It really is. And I think if anyone really, really knows, it's going to be Pauli Manalaji right there. Yeah, I tell you what, Teo, um, I, you made a really good point. I hadn't noticed that you, you've you actually, when you talk about Triple Crown, I was wondering what you were getting at with Triple Crown. You've beaten <laughs> the jewels of those two weight classes because yeah. Loma was the bona fide yep. number one when you beat him at the mm -hmm. 135. And Josh Taylor had beaten all the 140-pounders. He'd won the Super Series. He'd beaten Ramirez, and you beat him. Those are, that, that, you know... Looking at your resume, I always I even rate the Comey fight because you went at Comey for your world title and you you literally <laughs> went at him. You stopped him in two rounds, but you went at a big punching guy and you, and you took him on head on. You know, so I, I even rate the the Comey fight big wait, on your wait resume. Till, wait till I do. Wait till y'all see what I do to Ortiz. Look, I'm having my sparring partners I haven't been hitting them hard, and I'm dropping them body shots, head shots. I mean, I've only gotten better. Uh, I needed that fight. I needed those. Uh, I needed to feel that 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 flow again, and I got it, man. I got it, well, and and I got it more when I started being with my son because he got so much light in him, and he just gave it to his dad. Mm. Ooh, everybody, everybody is on some ish. <laughs> and you know what I love is that I don't want to fight ever again. So how do I do it? We put an example on Ortiz, and that's how you do it. Well, how do you how do you keep that fire? Because you know you you you're, you're bringing that up. How do you keep that fire consistent, right? Because I was gonna say you know, you beat the the jewels of the two weight classes. You know now that now I understand what you're saying with triple crown, and right now you got the double mm -hmm. crown, right? How do you how do you keep that fire? Now you are the jewel of the 140 pound division. Haney's right there, right behind you. I think Haney had a good win mm -hmm. over Progre. I think that's yeah. a great fight to make if it can be made. But of course, it takes two to tangle, right? But I think your resume tells, tells us on its own that you go after the jewels. You go after them directly, and you, you seek out those kind of fights. Haney now has won the 140-pound division, 140-pound world title with the WBC title. Um, so he's got options now to marinate on that title, or he can go after you. Um, I think, obviously, your track record shows us that you have no problem taking on the best guys in the weight class. So when, when George asks you, um, do we make see those fights i don't really see it being on you because i see your resume i see the way you came up you had a tough schedule coming up as a yeah. prospect so i don't everybody can do their level of ass kiss and all they want i 
I watch and I observe how you come up. And all those guys are good fighters. Even Haney's a good fighter, and, and, and you got 140 pounders that are good fighters. They're very good weight class. You have um, Matias who's hanging around there. Him not speaking English, I think Hurst has hurt his promotability, but his action packed style is really making him a, 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 an attention grabber. How do you keep the love? Right? You say you don't love boxing, but you're in such a, uh, an intense weight class right now, and you are the jewel of the weight class. How do you keep the love, and how do you not let it get away from you the way you let, kind of let it slip in the Cambosos fight, where people were kind of shocked? How do you keep this love? Because obviously, to, to train passionately, to keep improving the way you're improving, it's got to be some love there. How do we keep that going? And he looks like he loves um, it. Yeah, but he's saying he doesn't. Do... But he's saying he doesn't. Well, you know what I mean? So we need... Well, we, even for, the basis, even for the basis, even for the basis of the fans, I... Teal, for the because we love watching you fight, bro. You know what I mean? I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm a boxing fan. You're one of the guys I enjoy watching fight. You know what I mean? So it's like when you start hearing guys, oh, then I might be hanging, not hanging around. I'm sick of this. I, I don't blame you, bro. I was sick of the sport halfway through my career too, man. But, but you know, you still hanging around. You're making money. You're doing. This. But how do you keep that love? How do you keep that 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 eye of the tiger, so to speak? Um, how can I actually reframe this in that, in that context? I think it goes back to boxing made who I am today. So all I can do is pay it forward. And I think that's mm-hmm. the only thing that keeps my passion from brewing. It keeps that flame, that burning heart. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't sit across with you guys if it wasn't for boxing and building me, creating me from a boy to a man. And I think that I let boxing have its moment of, trying out all these other fighters. I let my wife test out and touch all these other boxes. And she said, I want you back. And I said, oh, man, I don't, I don't want to do this. You know, I, I'm very at peace with my, my life right now. I'm spending good quality time with my son. I don't got to hear the nagging. I don't got to fight and, and slay all these demons that come in the boxing world. And I'm just like, oh, man, but you know something? She needs me. She needs me. She don't want to die in the sport. And I say that I say that wholeheartedly because if we, if we keep this up and we let these suit and tie men um, take over boxing who never face or even lace boxing gloves, let alone take a punch to the face, um, where we're going to end up going is no more boxing, you know? And this is why I came back. This is the takeover well, for that reason. I don't want to hog the interview, but you're making me want to ask more questions. But the, the more you're talking, the more I'm getting, the more I'm getting excited. Because here's the thing. Here's, okay, you're making another great point here. The guy, the fighters not fighting each other. This is what, what kills the sport. Fighters not fighting each other. And everybody always exactly. says that. It's very cliche. But literally, exactly. you see networks dropping boxing because they don't get the fights they want. So fighters like yourself who want to make the big fights... You talk about paying it forward. That's paying it forward. Everybody who's looking to line their pockets with fights without having to fight the big fighters. Champ. Then the then the cha- the networks drop boxing, and then the people behind you can't get paid and can't don't have Champ. a home. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead. Go Champ, ahead. Champ. Listen, it's those kids that are going right now, getting ready to go to the Olympic Games for Paris, and hopefully, maybe if USA wins a gold medal, finally. Then maybe we'll get an opportunity in 2028. It's about to be 20 years, two decades that we haven't seen a gold medal for USA Boxing, Mm. for USA. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because it's been political. In the mail. Political. In the mail. Political. Mm -hmm. You know, listen, I won the U.S. Olympic trials back in 26 for the 2016 Olympic Games. And they gave it to this kid, Carlos Balderas, who Mm. never even we were supposed to have a box off, but they didn't want to because money was involved already and they already gave him the slot. So what what is that happening now? It's starting to lean over to what the boxing world of professional and all these other young fighters, all these young kids at dark still fighting, taking those losses, learning from them. And 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 we was one kids right Paulie we had to climb up those ranks and we had to be so somebody got to take a stand and Mm. I waited for Tank I waited for I waited for Tank Davis and Waheed nothing I waited for Devin Haney nothing I waited for Terrence Crawford nothing nobody is holding down holding down everybody's just collecting what's theirs and saying this is mine I got to take care of me and my family and it's like yes you do but what about the next generation behind us that are looking up to us and saying that's the fighter I want to be like it, that's and, that's inspiration. In, that's in, a different kind in, of to tell. In order, I got a kid. I got a kid, and yeah. I don't want my son to to deal with that. You know, if we don't fix this right now as adults and as men, then then where do we stand in in the jury of God's eyes? But, Look, He gave you, He gave you, Paulie, a gift. He gave me a gift, 
And it's what we do with that gift that allows us to be much greater. We end up becoming either great or the greatest. And that's the, that is the fine cue right there that puts the infinite sign. Mm. And it's like no one kind of quite understands it, but Teofimo does. And did I cry for four days before I signed this contract with Jermaine Ortiz? Freak, yes, I did. Yes, I did. You know why? Because I know what it's going to take for me to do this again. Winning the Sugar Ray Robinson Award at 23 years young. Only fought one time that year. COVID. The bubble. Lomachenko. Yep. Beat Richard Comey prior to that at 22 years young. Winning my first world title where? In the Mecca of boxing. I am, mm-hmm. I am set in stone. It is set in stone for me to fix boxing. And I don't know where it's going to take me, but I know that my main focus is February 8th. You put it all together in all perspective. This year is the year of the dragon, the year of the infinite. So we had at war. It's at war, man. And I know what you want to say, Paulie, and I'm on it with you, my man. And I know that if we both was on this, we we'll chew up the boxing world like it was uh well, like it was some breakfast. Well, that's the thing. You talk about guy fighters having guys to look up to. It's it, it's about even more than that, Teo, because if the networks are dropping boxing, there will be nobody on that platform to Why be able to look so? up to. You know what I'm saying? Because the networks are dropping boxing more and more because these dudes don't fight each other. So we have to make why sure these not? fight. And that's why at Pro Box here, we, we set it right from the mid-range already. Right from that below mm-hmm. type, below championship level, we make them fight each other. Because we're trying to set a standard that at a high level, it's got to be the same thing. Otherwise, networks are going to keep dropping boxing. You talk about you got prospects. If your prospects are of a certain level, man, we, you know we'd love to have them here. You know what I mean? We love guys who yep. want to test themselves against guys on their level, uh, not trying to pad records. Uh, it's at the point now where networks, are, there's so much options to go in different directions for the networks for the money that they don't want to pick up boxing if it's not going to give them the fights they want. So we've got to, the fighters today have a responsibility because generation after generation, if you don't make these fights, you're going to end up getting boxing dropped, bro. And that's why we're trying and, to set the president here. Exactly. And that's why it's all about making boxing great again. That's what I came back to do um, because I know as long as I keep facing the fighters, calling out champions like Terrence Crawford that people are like, this man's, this man's crazy. Well, yeah, I'm crazy. I mean, I'm crazy to be great. When was that a problem? You know, and I mentioned that. But Roberto Duran fought, fought all four kings or three kings and was a guy that everyone respects highly. Muhammad Ali faced Joe Frazier and so many other great champions that, you know, and, and got dropped in front of the world in front of him. Like, who cares? You go and you stand up. See, and, and it's like everyone has went soft on the internet. Social media really made a lot of these boxes soft because they say, well, I, I don't really need to fight nobody. I just got to say their name. Um, Sabrio Matias, no one knew about him until he started calling me out. He just do the facts. You know, he could be an IBF world champion, but he's the most softest fighter in the division. Why I say that? Because he's one dimensional to the point where Puerto Ricans, man, I tear they butt up. Puerto Ricans are easy to beat. And I don't care if the Puerto Ricans feel some type of way. Put them in front of me, we beat them. And and, and it doesn't it doesn't take away anything more than what it is. Look, everybody's going to Saudi Arabia, man. And and I love, you know, hey, to the prince and his excellency and all that. However, it's like, come on, guys. You guys are just doing this for the money pit now. And boxing is starting to realize that. Boxing has been in the game for for over two millennial years millennials we're talking about two millennials 1800s and if not before before that the gladiator times was boxing and it's like are we gonna really 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 stop the origin and the true true pure purity of boxing because of people wanting to collect money look at all these businessmen don't know business because they don't let the boxers handle it in the ring well, Teal, you talked about the Four Kings and you talked about previous generations. Uh, everyone loved the Four Kings because they fought each other. Yeah. And I know it's a different era, but you have names Mm-mm. that could potentially be, it could be the same kind of situation if you guys fought each other. I have one loss, and did that stop me from becoming a two time undisputed world champion? But they did had that stop losses me become, too. Did that stop me from, that's what I'm saying, though. That means that it has finally fallen onto me. Tank is not. Tank doesn't have a loss, which is why he now. Devin Haney doesn't have a loss, right? Ryan Garcia may have lo- one loss, but it's against who? Tank, right? But that was a that was a, a moment that they needed. Um, who else is undefeated at the time right now? Subriel Matias. Crawford. Okay, Matias. Matias has, has a loss. He, oh, he has, has a loss. loss. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. has a loss. Um, Terrence Crawford doesn't have a loss. Um, so all these guys that are undefeated right now still has their O. You know, it's great and all. When it was Floyd Mayweather, 
this is not Floyd Mayweather era. This is right, uh, right. bringing back boxing to what it was before, the best fighting the best, whether they had a win or a loss. MMA, you go any platform, PFL, UFC, Bellator, they got losses on their freaking record, and mm -hmm. yet they sell out the whole arena. Tail. You know, people just... They, they people just love violence, Tell regardless you, of what it is. Do you think it's 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 America, baby? We're, where violence, where violence is okay, and, and it's, it's crazy, but it's what it is. But we live <laughs> we live in a greedy time, bro. People don't want to do nothing for, without the astronomical amount of money. Do you think you brought up the Middle East? Do you think the Middle East type of money, the Middle East getting involved in the 140 pound division? You think it could take something like that? I've mentioned this in the past, actually, on our talk shows. Yeah, the you did. middle the Middle East money has gotten involved a lot in the heavyweight division and the bigger weights. But the weight, the, for me, the weight class they need to get involved in is a 140-pound division because yeah. it has the, an abundance of stars. And, and they really, a lot of guys don't want to fight each other in that weight class, man. I see you calling them out, but they, they, they're, not, they're not looking to jump in the ring with you or each other or among themselves to fight each other. So I'm saying this, are we gonna, if we could get that Middle East money, that Middle East money in the 140-pound division, is that what it would take to create a four king situation? Because the talent is there to create a four king situation, but yes. the desire to fight one another in this weight class isn't what it should be. Listen, I respect the uh, the Saudis and obviously his excellency and how he loves boxing. He said his two favorite fighters um, are Larry Holmes and Roberto Duran. That's <laughs> so something right there. Two pioneer freaking right. champions that really paved the way in the sport of boxing as well um, from from before my time and before Paulie or around Paulie's time. Right. So so we're talking about um, this man knows his boxing. I'm not going to go and reach out to him because – Honestly, before I followed him on Instagram, he followed me. So he's on it. He's on it. And it's all about um, placing the right things at the right time. See, I'm what motivates me and keeps me that passion is like, I know I could actually fix this sport. I know I can because I could have I have it in me as a uh, as a champion, as a champion's heart. And as someone that that understands a bit of the boxing world that, yes, we need the best of to fight the best. The only way these other fighters face Teal Fimo now are going to be wanting a $20 million check because they know that they're going to have a real hard time facing me. And and I don't care because they've all beaten, they all have run around and be around the bush, a lot of these fighters. And what they do, they pay these fans and these media outlets, right? And they pay them, pay them, pay them. But when they go on pay-per-view, then I can't even make over 50,000 pay-per-view sales. I wonder why. Because they pay these guys to come on their show. They pay everyone to keep them relevant. It's uh, it's like I could do the same thing, and I don't because I earn it with this, which is the real thing. That's mm -hmm. what, what a real man shows. Uh, when it comes to Saudi, do I like what he's doing? I respect that he loves the sport. You know, however, however, it's, 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 it's a tough time. And look how many desperate boxers went out there to support the Saudis. You know how much they showed that weakness, <laughs> that they need that money? I mean, we had legends out there, legends that, that have names that, that can live long, and they showed up there. And this is not disrespect to Saudi. This is just who I am, man. I didn't go out there. I got invited. I didn't show myself because I'm not there yet. And I don't mean by the finance. I mean by the legacy. I'm not going to disrespect what I've done by going to Saudi and letting them be like, oh, we got another one in the mix. But, no, but, you got you to gotta come find but me. Tell but they, but tell you, I'm gonna work they, hard. I I'm gonna work hard to be the last one standing, to where they have but, to find me. But tail from a business perspective, is networking the way though? You know what I mean? Is, is networking? No, the, yeah, of course. Is, of course, is the only is, way we're how, gonna is the only way we're how, gonna get tail versus Haney we, is, is Middle East money. We lost. We Go lost ahead. our twin towers. We lost our twin towers. We did. We lost Showtime and HBO. We lost our twin towers. Yeah. Boxing is mm. boxing's on its way out. The zone boxing. The zone boxing. I told you, the zone boxing is about to be done. They had to cut Eddie Hearn's. They had to cut Eddie Hearn's budget. The zone went to, and they said, "You're not giving us what we're asking for. We gave mm -hmm. you a shit ton of money, and we still haven't seen that back, Eddie Hearn." Yeah. And what yeah. they did, they cut. He said, "I have to cut fighters now." Yeah. And and it's like, yeah, you have to cut fighters because your ass don't know how to promote. Well, you the, ain't a good promoter. That's the he thing. He ain't tale. a good promoter. That's the thing, Tail. What what? But no, no, no. What's the thing is that you need a fighter like myself to go and fix this thing. And the only way we do it is by beating the guys that are in front of us, and then we grab all these other young, talented fighters under the wing. You teach them the game. You pass them the torch and say, go make your own business. Mm. Go make your own money. Because I already did mine. I solidified myself Hall of Fame. First ballot ticket Tail, at 25. You did it by fighting. 25. At 25. Tail, yes, you, you I did, did it by fighting each was, other. You did it by fighting but that's guys. What I grew, 
But Paulie, that's where I grew up learning yeah. from watching all you guys. So why is it changing now? Because now we're letting these uh we're letting these these dorks we're letting these dorks come on. We're, no, but honestly, we're letting these dorks come into the boxing world and be like, well, oh, listen to me because I know what you got to do with boxing. But, but they never fall.